Hi, everyone. I'm Matt Murphy, TOR Program Supervisor at Eastern State Penitentiary. Uh, today, I'm going to be leading you on a brief virtual tour of Soup Alley. I love this tour because I love food and I'm a big believer that you are what you eat. Uh, before we get started on this tour of this old prison dining hall, I want us to start thinking about what role diet nutrition might play in the reform process inside of prisons. Throughout our tour, I'll throw out some questions for you all to consider. Please let us know your thoughts in the chat section as we go along. Now, uh, it's important to understand the early history of food and dining at Eastern State. Soup Alley, the dining halls, weren't completed until 1924 when the prison was almost already a century old, nearly 100 years old. In the 19th century, Eastern State's prisoners lived under a form of strict solitary confinement known as the Pennsylvania system. Prisoners did everything in their cells. They worked, slept, exercised, prayed, met with instructors in their cells. And they also ate in their cells. Three times a day, guards brought the prisoners their meals uh, using the old fashioned feeding carts. You can see an old feeding cart at the bottom of this picture. Uh, some of these old feeding carts still exist in the prison. And they even had some nicknames. The first three were nicknamed uh, Washington, Franklin, and Lafayette after uh, the founding fathers. In the prison's earliest years, the prisoners received their meals through a slot in the wall known as a feeding hole. Uh, this photo is from around 1960, well after these feeding holes were uh, out of use. The guard in this picture seems to be showing off uh, the feeding holes like a bizarre feature of the weird old building that he works in. Uh, it's hard for me to imagine eating every meal of the day completely alone for years on end. How do you folks think eating alone affects the people that live in solitary confinement? So what did people eat in the 1830s? Uh, here we see an excerpt from an 1834 investigation of the prison. Now, investigators took issue with many parts of the prison's administration, but they seem to approve of the diet. It seems every meal had caffeine, lots of animal protein, and a nearly unlimited serving of either bread, rice, or potatoes. There also appears a mysterious carbohydrate known simply as Indian mush, some kind of porridge-like food. We're not really sure. Turnips and cabbage were offered, quote, in the form of kraut, salt, molasses, and vinegar were the available condiments. Now, feeding over a thousand prisoners in their cell daily was an extremely inefficient practice that continued for a decade, even after solitary confinement formally ended in the prison, simply because there was no alternative. By 1923, prisoners were playing baseball out in the yard, they were going to church together, they worked in factories, but they were still eating in their cells. The dining hall for prisoners to eat in just didn't exist in the original design. Things changed uh, when in 1923, a hard-nosed military veteran and founder of the Pennsylvania State Troopers named John Groom was appointed warden of the prison. Groom was hired to restore order to a chaotic building and bring the facilities into the 20th century. One of his first projects was building the dining halls that we now know as Soup Alley. Prison laborers demolished the old solitary exercise yards on the sides of cell blocks four and five, which flanked the kitchen building. They roofed him over and Soup Alley was born in 1924. When he was done, Groom bragged that he could feed his whole population of 1,400 men in two shifts of 700. So I think now it's time to step into Soup Alley and explore. Take your time and look around. So this would have been a pretty crowded space at mealtime, with hundreds of men filling through the small doors from cell blocks four and five. The line likely backed up into the central rotunda. Prisoners approached the serving counters in two single file lines. On your left, we see what we think was a guard space. Over your head, you can see the recently restored roof 
we just wrapped up a year long conservation process. The roof has been restored to its 1920s appearance, excuse me, uh, 1950s appearance. These are radiators on your right and your left, trying to keep the space comfortable. Prisoners are going to receive their meals from uh, one of the counters, one on the left and then one on the right. This still shot from 1929 shows prisoners filing through the alley and kitchen staff serving food through stall windows that uh, no longer exist. Note that the prison was racially segregated this time and food labor was mostly done by the black population. Subblocks four and five on either side of Soup Alley house black prisoners in part so they could quickly get to the kitchens. Then after receiving food at these counters, prisoners then continued to a uh, secondary food prep area. Let's go check them out. Straight ahead of you, you can see uh, an old industrial dishwashing machine. And we'll see an oven on our left and on our right. And this might've been like a place to get burgers for your buns, sauce for your spaghetti, something like that. Then after receiving food from this area, prisoners uh, would have split off. The two lines diverged, one line going into the dining hall in sub block four and one going into five. We're going into the sub block five dining hall right now. Hundreds of prisoners would have packed these cramped dining halls. Oral histories from former staff and prisoners remember the spaces as hot, tense, and uncomfortable. Guards apparently had a hard time monitoring these spaces because of the long, narrow configuration. You can still see some of those old benches and tables left behind. Let's go explore the dining hall some more, um, and then we'll take a walk down the alley towards the old kitchen building. We're not quite done fixing this space up. Conservators are working hard. You can see some of their equipment left behind. We've never been able to take visitors all the way through the dining hall for safety purposes. You can see the collapsed roof. There was a roof over your head in this play, uh, section historically to protect food and prisoners from the elements, but mealtime in Eastern State was definitely uh, an indoor outdoor experience. And it's still that way today when it comes to giving tours. Here's a kitchen building. Here's a view from the early 20th century. Cooking was originally done in the front building, uh, the part the, of the building that really looks like a castle. But as the population grew, more space was needed. Uh, built in 1903, it provided food for up to 1,800 men three times a day. The kitchen uh, isn't ready for visitors yet. We can't people take it, can't take visitors inside the building, but it's a really amazing space and we hope to get in there someday. Check out that giant steam hood uh, and with industrialized sized vats of food underneath. That steam hood is still there. Here we see the bakery in action. Uh, it seems like bread was always made on site at Eastern State from day one. This is a prisoner baker working while being supervised by a guard. Those old brick 19th century ovens are uh, still in place actually. So what did the prisoners eat in Soup Alley? Uh, let's step back into the dining halls and we'll take a look at a menu from the mid 20th century. Straight ahead of you, you can see the exit gate where prisoners would have uh, filed out to return to the rest of the day. This is the menu for the week of April 17th, 1949. Why don't we read what we would have eaten today? Uh, today's Wednesday. 
for breakfast, it looks like chilled stewed peaches, two sweet Marie's with icing. That's kind of like a, a breakfast pastry bar, bread, coffee, milk, and sugar. Then for lunch, grilled hamburger steak, brown gravy, boiled onions and cream sauce, whole boiled peeled potatoes and a beet salad, bread, coffee, and milk. And then for dinner, chili con carne, home fried potatoes, cream rice, raisin pudding, sweet relish, bread, hot tea with sugar. So what do you folks think of the menu? Let us know in the comments section. Notice at the bottom uh, that the resident physician, the assistant steward, the warden all had to sign off on the menu uh, to make sure that prisoners got their recommended daily allotment, they got their vitamins and minerals. Also, side note, notice the scrapple on the menu under breakfast on Monday. Uh, Eastern Saint knew what's up. Scrapple was served with fried eggs, syrup, and ketchup. And that's how I eat mine. Sometimes when I give this tour to folks from out of town, they ask me what scrapple is. And I love explaining this Eastern Pennsylvania delicacy. It usually raises some eyebrows. It's basically like if you boiled pork parts down until it was a paste and cooked it on a griddle. Not everybody likes it. Now, by modern prison standards, Eastern states food in the 20th century would have been considered fresh and nutritious. When Greaterford Penitentiary opened in 1928 as a sister prison to Eastern state about 30 miles away, it operated as a farm with prisoners working in the fields. Farm fresh dairy and produce were sent to Eastern for consumption. In the 19th century, there was more space on the grounds and the prison had numerous vegetable gardens, uh, a little pig farm, and even a dairy cow. However, food quality wasn't always top notch. It looks like uh, there were some low points in the culinary history. This cartoon was drawn two years before Soup Valley was built. The artist, a prisoner named Frederick Funk, shows a scene with a prisoner complaining that the food made him sick. Uh, an overseer or guard is looming over him, threatening him with an ice bath in the hospital if he doesn't get up. In 1897, there was an investigation into the prison and the investigator said the food was quote, of inferior grade. There was another investigation in 1903 that charged that there were quote, irregularities in the furnishing of food. Now, today, most prison systems outsource their food service to private companies like Aramark who cut costs by using frozen processed foods. You can go online and see the Pennsylvania Department of Corrections uh, menu on a plate. You can see a picture of every meal of the month uh, that's on offer. Uh, this is breakfast for Wednesday on week three. And here is uh, lunch for that same day. So how does that look to you folks? How do you think it compares to the menu items we saw on Eastern States menu? Now, one former Eastern State Guard told me that when mealtime was over, he would step into the dining hall, clap his hands loudly, and that signaled to the prisoners to stand up and leave the dining halls. Prisoners would then head down the alley, out the gate, and split off to the rest of their day, whether it was work, recreation, or back to their cells. That's the end of our tour. Thanks so much for joining me. If you have questions, let us know in the chat and we are gonna to try to answer them. I'm not seeing anything. Uh, so thanks for joining me. If you wanna stay connected in the meantime, oh, looks like we got some coming in. Any specific menus for prisoners with health conditions like diabetes? Uh, that's an awesome question. Uh, throughout the history of Eastern State, uh, the prison physician would prescribed special diets. In the 19th century, a prisoner might pre be prescribed uh, the milk diet. That would be like milk, sugar, sometimes like an egg beat into it. This was usually prescribed to people suffering from tuberculosis. Uh, it was a, it's kind of like a wasting disease and 
uh, extreme weight loss is one of the more noticeable signs. So they thought the sugars and the fats, it was easy to digest and would help keep weight on. Uh, there was also the chocolate diet. Uh, believe it or not, prisoners could be diet, recommended uh, a diet of chocolate. Uh, they thought that there were serious uh, medicinal properties. So that's kind of interesting. Then in the 20th century, the hospital block, sub-block three, actually had a special diet kitchen in it. Uh, and so people recovering from surgery or people that had diabetes or dyspepsia uh, that needed a special, special uh, diet, they, could, they would eat from that kitchen. What quantity of food did they get seconds? Uh, it seems like in the 19th century, prisoners uh, kind of could eat to their fill. Uh, that same investigation from 1834, the investigator, investigator says that like you'd have to be a, uh, a hog to be able to eat all the food that they offered. So it seems like a lot. In the 20th century, I think it changed throughout the period. I've, I've talked to some former prisoners who remember that you could go back and get more, while some said that there wasn't enough time. So there's that issue of like, if you're the last guy in line, the clock was running and you might have had less time than the first guy in line. So it depended. Were there different lunch, different lunch periods or did everyone come through at once? Uh, it seems like in the 1920s, uh, John Groom points out that he had to feed in two shifts of 700. Uh, at its peak, Eastern State had about 1,800 men. So they definitely had to break it up uh, and feed in different shifts. Uh, in the 19th century, apparently it took so long to feed everybody in their cells that by the time they were done getting breakfast out to the cells, it was basically time to start lunch and the same with dinner. That's a good question too. Let's see, any other questions? I think that's it. So thanks for the excellent question, folks. Uh, I hope to see you next Wednesday at 2.30 uh, for another tour of Eastern State. Uh, there are lots of ways to stay connected in the meantime uh, through Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and our awesome website, easternstate.org. Thanks a lot. Uh, hope to see you next week. Bye.